Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. Oh, 
with great pleasure that I announce the first award of tonight's program, which honors a man who understood that true impact could happen at the intersection of art and activism. Pioneering comedian Dick Gregory turned our pain into laughter. He represented the resilience of black America in the face of systemic racism. And in the process, he forced America to take a good look at itself, the hypocrisy, the dark history, and even the strides to rectify the past. Dedicating himself to a range of social issues that impacted marginalized communities, Gregory never recoiled at putting himself on the front lines, whether that was through protests, fasting, striking, and yes, even running for office. Gregory answered a higher call to be both an artist and an agent for social change. And through it all, he never lost. He never, ever lost that joy. Here to accept the Legacy Justice Award on behalf of her father, please welcome my friend, the phenomenal Ayana Gregory. So um, before I share this song, I just want to say that um, I just want to say thank you because there's some people in this room that helped to take care of my father uh, in his travels. My father survived three assassination attempts, and he lived out his full life and transitioned at 84, almost 85 years old, when he was good and ready. The song that I'm gonna share with you is a theme song to a play that I wrote called Daughter of the Struggle. And I've been traveling the country doing this particular play, and it is such a, a beautiful opportunity for me to keep my father close to me and to celebrate him and for him to come through me. And the first time that my father saw the play, and I'm so grateful he saw it but while he was still here in the flesh, he cried and he said that Malcolm, Medgar, and Martin never got the opportunity to hear their children talk about them. And um, I, didn't, I didn't recognize how significant that was until it happened. And so, without further ado, I'd like to present to you my love song to my father entitled, Ballad for My Father. Nineteen thirty two, somehow, Mama knew God had a plan for you with a light around your head. Some tried to hurt you, but you made them laugh instead. Funny man, superstar, change of plans, the movement called. Ten kids and a wife 
But human rights became your life Like all the other universal pearls, daddy You belong to the world didn't know what you meant to this world if I had a dime for every time somebody told me that you saved their life and changed their minds you planted seeds so long ago deep in me so I would grow into a flower who loves herself dad I had to tell you myself so proud of what you stand for all these years that you've endured broken heart brilliant mind so ahead of your time black man with the keys in your hands oh you opened up the Daddy was cool Always Broke the rules With the courage To tell the truth He brought the rhythm Heal our blues Black man With the keys In your hands Oh you opened up the way For a new day let me tell you something. From hunger strikes to war on drugs, taking on the corporate thugs, you went to jail a thousand times, exposing white supremacy crimes. From human rights to eating right, led the world to the light. A universal God force, information is your power source. Fire starter, innovator, peacekeeper, magic maker. Off, philosopher, comedian, warrior, soul survivor, golden sun, freedom fighter, chosen one, living legend, the coolest, yeah. See, the world still ain't caught up with you, yeah, no, no. Black man with the keys in your hand. Oh, you opened up the way for a new day. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory, yeah. till victory is won, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a daughter of the struggle, and I love my daddy. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. awesome. Please give her another hand. That was just amazing. Wow. Whew. Well, I hope viewers at home are using the hashtag justice 
looks like. Please use the hashtag justice looks like to let us know what they want the future of criminal justice to be in this country. This next segment hits close to home. Women and girls of color are often left unprotected in the system of criminal justice from the introduction of harsher sentencing to racial biases that lead to severe punishments. This often means they are criminalized at high rates. In fact, their incarceration numbers have skyrocketed over the last three decades due to the war on drugs, the school to prison pipeline, and other factors. For girls, this starts young. And for women, navigating a system largely built with men in mind, it can be grossly unfair. In a powerful piece that explores how this impacts individuals at various stages of life, please welcome activists Naomi Wadler, Jamira Burley, Kemba Smith, and Judith Brown Dionese, as they represent the stories of countless women and girls who have fallen victim to the system. I am only a child, but in the eyes of authority, I am a problem. When I talk in class, I get sent to the principal's office. When I ask for help, I get a stern look. When I raise my hand, I get ignored. When I raise my voice ever so slightly, people around me get nervous. And if I dare to ask why, I get sent home. I am only a child. And I might not yet understand that my black skin makes me look less innocent to those around me, to my white counterparts. But I do know that it's not fair. I am only a child, but the presence of police officers in my school is a normal thing. I see them come into classrooms. I see them as they drag students out with force. Girls that look like me. I see them as they escort us out of schools. I notice how some of those girls never come back, and nobody cares, and nobody tries to save them. I'm only a child, but children like me who are pushed out of schools through suspensions and expulsions are eight times more likely to fall victim to the school-to-prison pipeline. And I know that's not fair. I'm only a child, and while I am not that child, while this is not my personal experience, I do understand that girls like me deserve to be comforted, to be nurtured, to be protected, to be given a chance to learn and play, to be heard. I am only a child, but my freedom is what justice looks like. My freedom is our future. I am not an adult yet. I am a minor who age means I cannot consent who age means that I should be required under the law to be protected. I am not yet an adult, but when I stand before a judge to explain that I am a victim of sexual trafficking, I am not heard. When I say that I ran away from my safety, it is an arrestable offense. They do not care that I am a minor. They do not protect me. And when I protect myself, I pay the ultimate price. I am not yet an adult, but I am sentenced like one funneled through the system largely desi designed for men with no regards to the fact that I am a girl, a minor, a victim. I sit in prison with no consideration for my lack of resources to help me overcome the trauma of sexual assault, of mental health, of abuse, of poverty, with no special consideration to the fact that I, cannot, that I was protecting myself because other systems put in place to protect minors, have never been kind to me. Me, I am Jameera Burley, and I am an adult. But as a minor, I was also a victim to our juvenile justice system. I've witnessed as girls like me, girls like Barisha Edwards and Centoya Brown, both numbers who have continued to increase our criminal justice system, both in the juvenile detention system and in the prison system. I know identifying the signs of abuse are critical. 
I know that the systems are not built to protect them in situations like this. They are not adults, but they deserve to be protected by law. They deserve to be considered. They deserve to be named. And they deserve to grow up outside of the restraints of the pipeline to stereotypes that push them into prisons. This is what my justice looks like. What was I supposed to do? I knew about the drugs. I knew about the money. But I didn't participate. I only knew. I didn't do the crime, but I wanted to be honest, so I told them. I told them I knew. I wouldn't get in trouble, right? I knew women who did things for their men out of love. They did it out of fear. They did it for their children. They did it out of manipulation. They wanted to be down. But I didn't do it. I just knew. And I got 24 years. And I was seven months pregnant, a college student, my first nonviolent offense. And the law wanted me to spend more than two decades in jail because I knew, not because I participated. For women, drug conspiracy laws are particularly damaging. They impact individuals based on their romantic associations with a partner involved in criminal activity. And they often leave children to the tentacles of trauma. Over 2.7 million children. I'm going to say that again. Over 2.7 million children. I think of my son, who for six years was without his mother. I think about women who due to mandatory sentencing guidelines are thrown into prison for long periods of time for nonviolent crimes. I think about those who don't have national campaigns for clemency on their side. I think about that grave miscarriage of justice that so many people are spending chunks of their lives behind bars for nonviolent offenses. And I think about me and my personal story. That woman is me. And the fact that I'm on this stage now is both a blessing and a testimony. But it's also a reminder that we have to do so much more. A reminder that I represent just one person in the 700% increase of incarcerated women over the past 30 years. That is unacceptable. That is not what justice looks like, and it is time for change. I'm finally free. I paid my dues to society, and I am finally free. I'm even in a reentry program to make sure I stay free, but it's not easy. Life out here is different. I feel lost. Technology is hard. I can't find a job. I'm not in a relationship with a man, so probation officers look at me funny. They tell me to limit my visits to family, even though they are toxic. They say my queer behavior is risky because they don't understand it. They don't approve my housing plans post reentry because I'm not going home to a boyfriend, a husband. They don't consider that this heteronormative patriarchal way of thinking means queer women aren't actually free or that heterosexual women are being forced to re-enter environments with men that got them into the system in the first place. They don't consider the mental toll or the damage that toll takes when it's too much 
and we resort to addiction and depression. They don't consider what freedom means for a woman who leaves the prison walls. For queer women, for trans women, for all women. We know women are always on the front lines of change. And we often expect women to save the world. Now, it's time for this country to do its part, to uplift, empower, and center our stories and the intersections where we live, our unique circumstances, our needs, to prioritize our return to society and to take measures that curb recidivism. Women are needed to turn the tide. Women matter in the fight for criminal justice reform. Women are the future. Women are what justice looks like. Good evening. My name is Desmond Mead, and I am president of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, and we're leading an effort in Florida that's going to transform this country. And I'm Dante Stallworth, CNN contributor, former NFL player, and member of the Players Coalition, made up of former and current NFL players that are trying to, uh, how can I say this, trying to make a change without the help of the guy sitting in the White House yeah. being a barrier to our work. <laughs> so tonight we've talked uh, a lot about the tools of this country's criminal justice system and the way that these tools disenfranchise in the press. But how does this system compare internationally? Well, there are two often overlooked prongs of oppression that are unique to America's justice system one that occurs within the walls, and the other occurs outside the walls. And it happens once you've paid your debt to society. And that's those are solitary confinement and voter disenfranchisement. The link between these two subjects might not seem clear, but when comparing how other countries handle these practices, it becomes more evident that America stands in the lane all its own. While there's no conclusive data that American solitary confinement environments are more than harsh studies, I'm sorry, more harsh than others. Studies do show that this nation imposes one of, the, one of the most punitive regimes of solitary confinement in the world. This is because solitary confinement usually bypasses courts and is administered by prison officials who can then send an official, an individual, away for minor infractions or for nothing at all. In some cases, that means an individual can spend the majority of their time in solitary confinement. In America, we have created supermax facilities with the sole purpose of locking humans away in a cell for 23 hours a day. After two centuries of well-documented reports about the effects of this inhumane punishment, we are still locking people up at a time despite the physical and mental illnesses the psychotic episodes, the deterioration in health, and even suicides that are associated with this solitary confinement. And it doesn't take months or years to feel the effects. It takes minutes. We know that one of the ways to confront these conditions and abolish this outdated punishment is in the voting booth. Unfortunately, those impacted by this system can't even vote for change. In this country, citizens lose their right to vote due to felony convictions. And because the 14th Amendment allows states to decide on this matter, there are restrictions at every turn. 
This creates a hodgepodge of policies that limits, assist, that limits a citizen access to the voting booth. Citizens never lose the right to vote in only two states. And in four states, they don't let formerly convicted felons vote at all. Four, that is permanent disenfranchisement of American citizens. But the fact remains that 6.1 million people in this country are disenfranchised due to a felony conviction. Most of those people have already completed all portions of their sentence. Now, while we recognize the historical and racist context of voter disenfranchisement, like a tumor, these policies have now spread and have impacted Americans from all walks of life. Taking away our right to choose is like taking away our right to live and thrive in this country. Again, America stands alone as one of the only countries that refuses to let formerly incarcerated folks vote. And for people like me, who have been allowed to reenter society after paying our debts, we need you to vote with both hearts and minds. And for those of us who can, we must continue to fight for the rights of folks like myself and Dante, along with millions of others across this country, to help them regain the ability or their right to vote. So tonight, we ask each of you to join the fight to let, let my people, people vote. <laughs> I'm not going to do it all, Michael. All of it, all of it. All I'm not going to do it all. Every bit of it. No, yes. no. Mm -hmm. yes. Wow. Hey, How wow. powerful was, were those words? Please give them another hand. For yeah. Me. We're all fighting. We're all fighting. Um, if it shows us anything, it's that freedom is expensive, very expensive. It costs a lot in both dollars and humanity. That's so true. There are so many injustices in this country that feed into the criminal justice system. Here to perform a song that encapsulates that dilemma are The Crossroads, Raheem Devon, and Wes Felton. Woo! Peace, y'all. How you feeling? Peace, y'all. How y'all feeling? When I say love, you say life. Love. Love. That's what this moment is about right now. Let's go. America. Yes. America me. America, yeah. America, yeah, yeah. America me. Land of the home. Free the sun. Picking signs. Protest lines, yeah. America, America. Violent nights and police lights, well, well. America, America. Body bags is filled with youth, yeah. Living in America. With no remorse, they bang and shoot, yeah. Uh, they, they bang, 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 bang. The global warming that kill our air. America, America. The not guilty birdies, don't the jury care. America, America. Religious wars and social wars, well. Wow. Living in America. They'll sell you dreams, they buy, buy your souls. souls. Uh, oh, in America, America. yeah. Uh, uh, America, uh, yeah. Uh, America, yeah. America, America, me. I said some tears for thee, the sun. Yeah. Uh. America, yes. America, yeah, yeah. America, yeah. me. Land of the home. For our brothers over in Southeast struggling. Drop your house and sell, sell your bricks. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So they indict you, you want your homeboy snitch. snitch. Yeah. Well, well, well. Uh. Some go down and come home next, next summer. summer. Well. Oh. But now these courts is giving football numbers. Numbers, 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 numbers. We say we want to be equal, but we kill our people. America, America. They say we lost their way, but we failed our children. Well, America, America. But the change is coming. Here's, Here's the proof. Uh, yeah, yeah. In America. If you need knowledge to sell, Here's, Here's the truth. Well, uh, well. For 
for New America. I pledge yeah. allegiance I to America. I thank God I never wanted to be a clone. I idolize Al Capone, a rock, a herring bone, or disrespect my mom in and out of her home. Never been a brother ashamed the way I was from. You gotta go out and get it, not wait for it to come. Never been addicted to that coke or that rum. Never took a life with a gun to harm the human for fun. But I got a few gangsters who protect me and my son. You can't get into formation without information. This country's in peril. Too many people hating. We think being famous is the same as reparations. We think smoking trees is the same as meditation. Or others are using it as a form of medication. Incarceration is the new black vacation. I'm trying to practice this hope with a whole lot of patience. I want to feel American pride with lots of cadency. We the only people on the planet taught to hate our culture. While others exploit, eat off of it like vultures. Stress on the inside like ulcers. Racist government stretch from D.C. to Tulsa. Ain't you tired of the madness and the lies? Ain't you tired of the murders and the cries? Meanwhile, Kim trailing in the sky. But y'all don't want to hear that in your music or your rhymes. How you gonna matter if you think that you better? And cause you got some money that your water's more wetter. Ha, ha, ha. Jokes on you while you an actor. You got less influence on your kids than the average rapper. Got the nerve to walk around with your chest poked out while your daughter's getting turned out and son's getting smoked out. Man, let's get these votes out so we can get these racist folks out. Uh, America. Yeah. America, yeah. Uh, yeah. America, me. I said some tears for me. Yeah. America. America. America, me. Land of the home and freely somewhere. For the land of the free. And the home. The home of the free. Thank you very much. My name is Wes Felton. This is Raheem Devon. Collectively, we are the crossroads. Let us not forget that the struggle continues. If I have the power and you got the power, that means we got the power. And that's what? Power to the people. All power to the people. Thank you. Peace enough. Viola Davis. <laughs> Action is a small word with huge consequence, but that's why we're here tonight to take action and cut the enormous cost of the prison system. Significant strides have been made to reform criminal justice, including efforts to end cash bail, reclassify drug crimes, decriminalizing marijuana, and reexamining mandatory sentencing. Organizations and individuals in this room and watching at home have already made significant progress and you all are sharing your ideas using the hashtag. What does it say? <laughs> say it again! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But we have so much more to do, ladies and gentlemen. We have so much more to do. And trust me when I say that voting moves these changes along. Say it along with me. Voting moves these changes along. Welcome to the stage, a powerful trio to give us the tools to create a transform transformational vision for the future where voters prioritize criminal justice reform. Here to talk about it are Deputy National Political Director of the ACLU, Udi Offer, Cook County State's Attorney, Kim Fox, and Philadelphia District Attorney, Larry Krasner. All right, how's everyone doing? 
What an incredible program so far. So we're going to switch gears a bit for the next few minutes. We've been talking um, a lot about um, the problem of mass incarceration. And we are now going to start digging into the solutions to mass incarceration. And um, for the next few minutes, we are going to talk about the role of elected officials and specifically prosecutors, um, the role that they play in ending mass incarceration. You know, one of the most amazing things about the current movement for criminal justice reform is this kind of new awakening to the role that prosecutors have played in fueling mass incarceration. Americans are literally waking up and actually checking to see who is their elected prosecutor, things they've never really thought about before. They're waking up to the fact that prosecutors hold the key to ending mass incarceration. They're waking up to the fact that uh, prosecutors have incredible discretion in deciding who to charge and who not to charge, what to charge, what does uh, time in prison and jail look like. And they're waking up to the fact that of the 2,400 or so prosecutors in America today, the vast majority run uncontested. It's just, you know, no one's challenging them. So this kind of awakening is also leading to real transformative change. And it, it, all across America today, uh, uh, voters are electing reformers. They're creating changes in prosecutorial offices from the outside and from the inside. At the ACLU Campaign for Smart Justice, which I direct, in 2018 alone, we are looking at 14 states where we're doing massive voter education, mobilization, to herald in a new era of prosecutors in America. Prosecutors who prioritize people over prisons. So here we are. And within this world that I live in, you two are celebrities, right? You are superstars. Um, you know, we are so honored to have you here tonight as kind of the, the leaders of this new wave of prosecutors who are coming into um, 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 uh, to hold office. Um, so I wanted to hear from you, we want to hear from you, um, and talk a bit about, you know, the fact that you came in on a reform platform. Um, you know, State Attorney Kim Fox, uh, District Attorney Larry Krasner. Um, you know, and now you're, you're still in your first term. Reflect back a bit and, and, and tell us, like, of, of, of your time so far, what do you see as the most significant steps that you were able to take to begin reducing mass incarceration? And even more importantly, how are you going to give yourself a grade at the end of your, at the end of your first term? So first, I think it's really incredible that we're having a conversation with prosecutors around ending mass incarceration. The fact of the matter is, if you're going to do something about it, prosecutors are key. Um, for me, in Chicago, Cook County of Chicago, Illinois, um, we are the second largest prosecutor's office in the country. Um, I'm the first African-American woman to hold this position. Um, and, and that's significant because when we talk about representation, when we talk about who uses our criminal justice system in the school to prison pipeline and the numbers for girls, I also come from public housing. I also I have more in common with the people who come into the criminal justice system than the lawyers that I work with. And so that has framed my perspective on how do we talk about the system, how do we talk about the people that we serve. Um, and it has meant things like um, being open and transparent with our work. So we just released a few months ago six years worth of case level data um, that looks at everything that we do from charging decisions to sentences um, so that people can see for themselves if there are disparities, um, and, and we know there are going to be disparities in the justice system, so that we can then tailor and shape our policies to address that. And so some of the things that we've done have been around using our prosecutorial discretion to raise thresholds uh, for retail theft, um, which in Illinois the threshold was $300, um, so someone could be charged with a felony for retail theft. Uh, we use our discretion to raise it to $1,000 or 10 prior convictions. Um, we stopped prosecuting cases of people driving on suspended licenses for failure to pay tickets because we realized that that was the criminalization of poverty. Um, and things like that that we could look at and say, four years from now, using the data, were we able to drive down 
incarceration rates while maintaining public safety. Um, because that's our goal, is to keep communities safe and thriving, and the policies and practices that had been in place were not aimed towards that goal. And, and the jail population in Cook County is down, correct? The jail population, because we also took on bail reform, um, and as a prosecutor, taking on bail reform is very different uh, in Cook County. The county jail population has dropped by 40% since 2013. <clears throat> Kaiser? You know, the bottom line is DA's made the problem. They might want to fix it. Uh, you do stupid things for decades and you get stupid results. So what do you do? You stop trying to charge things that shouldn't be charged, like possession of marijuana. You do exactly what Kim spoke of, which is if you could charge a case as a felony, but you don't have to. You don't charge it as a felony. You divert cases before there are ever charges. And you don't just do it for juveniles. You do it for adults. You bring lower charges where appropriate. You divert cases afterward. In the bail process, you do not ask for cash bail for a whole category of cases that are not so serious, and this is because we have to deal with the Pennsylvania bail laws as they are. You know, in Philadelphia, just in the 120 or so days that our administration has been in there, we have seen one day after another 20-year lows in the prison population because the reductions went from about six a day to about 13 a day as a consequence of these policies and other policies, like asking for sentences for negotiated pleas where there does need to be a conviction that are below the sentencing guidelines, like not pursuing mandatory sentences. There are so many different ways that experienced prosecutors can affect these jail populations, and they should be judged on it. If you're going to come in saying you're bringing reform, then you better get some people out of jail. You have to be careful that you're getting the right ones out of jail because Charles Manson right. might need to be in jail. But you do have to, you know, you've got to be judged on the numbers. You've got to be judged on your results. And you've even done something that I haven't seen anyone else do. You've now charged the prosecutors to actually take into account the cost, the fiscal cost of their charging decisions or plea bargaining decisions and so forth. There's nothing worse than asking a lawyer to do math, but that is in <laughs> fact what we are doing. Uh, we are requiring our prosecutors when they're asking for a sentence to... Uh, figure out how much it costs and to explain to the court why that sentence is appropriate. And we've done that because, you know, if you have someone who's mentally ill who's uh, doing retail theft for the fourth time, you should have to explain to the taxpayer and the court why it is worth $42,000 to put that person in jail for a year for stealing $13 yeah, worth of food. That's amazing. You know? So, uh, you know, for us, I'm sure many people in the, in the room today, people are watching the idea of becoming a prosecutor, maybe not be the most enticing thing for someone who wants to be a criminal justice reformer, or at least the way we've historically thought about it. Make the case for why if you care about ending mass incarceration, you should actually run. Well, first of all, maybe, you know, you should either run to be a prosecutor in your town or work in a prosecutor's office. Yeah, the prosecutor is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system. You do not get before a judge unless a prosecutor decides to charge you or not to charge you. And while we need a robust, as you saw Annalise say, we need a robust defense counsel um, to defend the work that happens, uh, the fact of the matter is we can have a serious impact on not even having people have to go through the criminal justice system that don't belong there by having strong, committed prosecutors um, who care about the work. And I think it's really important when we talk about diversity, particularly the impact on communities of color and particularly impact on poor communities of color. If we do not have people who come from that perspective, making the discretionary decisions, talking about those cultural competencies, looking at the impact personally, um, then you end up with people who are not proximate to these issues, making policy that impacts your community. And so to not be a part of the solution, to leave that to someone else and only respond to that, um, I think does a disservice to your community. I would just say it's not enough to fight the good fight. You need to win. And if you're going to win, you've got to have power. And if you're going to have power, then you're going to have to go to where the power is. And the power is inside the walls of the DA's office. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 30 years, civil rights lawyer for 30 years before I did this for better or worse. And I'm telling you what you already know. The power is on the inside of that office. You cannot let other people define what a prosecutor is or what a prosecutor's office is. You need to take that back and take it away from people who've been doing the wrong thing for a long time. Great. So we're now, uh, we're, we're going to end and we're going to show a video as we walk up the stage to introduce, it's actually a perfect segue from this panel, to introduce a brand new project that's being launched by the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice today. And it's called Boat Smart Justice. 
and everyone should be taking out their phone and logging on to votesmartjustice.org or as you walk out today, sign up um, in a booth that we have outside and, and, and enter your email address. This is going to be the first of its kind effort in America where we are going to engage in a massive voter education and voter mobilization effort in up to 3,000 races in 2018, all focused on criminal justice reform. So the, the centerpiece is this uh, first of its kind website where you get to enter in your zip code and address and it'll tell you where candidates for Congress, where candidates for governor, and where candidates for state legislature stand on criminal justice reform. Um, we are going to inspire voters to vote for people, not for prisons, and here's a quick intro video to this new effort. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, and hold on, hold on, hold on. And hold on, hold on, and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, and hold on, hold on, hold on. And hold on, hold on, and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold 